Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining me this evening. Um, tonight, going to look at a really old subject, old in the sense, well, it's certainly been around longer than me anyway, the hierarchy of needs as proposed by Abraham Maslow. Now, Abraham Maslow, he he believed that human beings are motivated by a series of needs. Now, our needs are different from our wants, our demands, our likes, things like that, um, our preferences. These are our needs. Needs things that we need in order to be able to survive, to be able to thrive, okay? So he he recognized that human beings are motivated by a series of needs and he organized them into a hierarchical structure. Now, what he believed was you can't really move to the next level until you've met the one below or the, the levels above aren't necessarily as important unless you meet the, the level below. So this evening, I'm going to, give a brief outline of the hierarchy of needs. I'm also going to look at it in the context of how other people can exploit those needs in order to coerce, control, manipulate, and so on. But then I'm gonna look at it a third time, one last time, about how the hierarchy of needs can be used to help identify um, things like recovery, moving forward, um, a useful way to be able to measure progress. So, Let's jump right in. So as I say, uh, Maslow came up with this hierarchy of needs. This is where graphics would be useful, but I don't have any. So I'm gonna ask you to imagine a pyramid, a triangle split into different layers, okay? And at the bottom of that pyramid would be what's known as just our basic physiological needs. Now that's something as simple as food, water, somewhere to sleep, clothing, things like that. Our basic needs, the things we need in order to just survive. I have no idea what that noise was. It should have been silent. Anyway, just ignore any noises you hear. Above the physiological, we have our safety needs. For instance, you think of our security, our safety. It's not just that we have something to eat. We need to know where our next meal is coming from. We need to know that when we are asleep, the big monster is going to come and get us or whatever. Um, it's It's stability. It's being in an environment that is reasonably predictable. We're not expecting, as I say, monsters and things like that. Then after that, we move on to our relationships, or if you will, our social needs, our relationships, our connection with others, our need for love, our need for belonging, our need to feel a part of something. And when we have that social connection, when we have that social connection, you know, we have things like friendships, we have intimacy, um, we, we join groups, communities, things like that. Human beings, I think at their very core, are social creatures. We need a sense of belonging. We feel this need to be a part of something. When we have those relationships, when we feel as if we're a part of something, we feel connected, we move on to the next level, and that would be our esteem. And there are just things like our, our self-respect, our confidence, how we feel about ourselves, how we, how we recognize how other people feel about us, again, with that sense of belonging. Um, if you will, it's, it's sometimes it's even just our desire for some kind of recognition. We want to be recognized as, as a human being, as a unique human being, um, as somebody with something to contribute or with someone who requires a level of support and people are willing to help us as much as we're willing to help them. The very top of the pyramid, this is quite a tricky one, and I'm going to address this as well when I'm talking about the narcissistic side of it, is self-actualization. Now, what Maslow believed is at the top of the hierarchy, the self-actualization, that rep represents, if you will, our highest potential. That is what we aspire. That is um, when we want to try something, we want to do something, we achieve something. Um, it could be argued human beings never really go as far as they can because there is always room for growth and we do find new challenges but when we do achieve something for instance you want to learn to drive so you learn to drive you pass your driving test we feel a sense of pride in that but that we that it doesn't end there because there are new challenges come so if you think of that it's like recognizing our creativity it's um, our talents, it's our abilities, it's our resilience to, to um, get through setbacks and things like that. So that, if you will, is the hierarchy of needs. Now, Maslow suggested that the other levels 
aren't that important or you know they're hard to reach if the ones below aren't really reached so if i could give an example of that if you imagine someone who doesn't really know where their next meal is coming from they're in a state of desperation um they maybe they don't know where they're going to sleep tonight the last thing they're going to do is to prepare for tomorrow morning's exam or whatever you know something else is just suddenly taken priority that's a very brief way of looking at it maybe a, a dramatic way of looking at it but even um things like our 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 need to connect with others if we don't have that sense of safety and security uh we we might find it difficult to trust we might find it difficult to um to allow people into our lives to to be able to mix to feel connected there's more like a disconnect there so that as i say is a brief outline of the hierarchy of needs when it comes to those needs being exploited i suppose the best way i could illustrate it is it's something that i saw on television i was about 10 15 years ago it was a long time ago now but i think this illustrated it brilliantly this is how people exploit our needs um and it was a story of this this woman whose daughter had she was from the uk and the daughter had left to travel america as a student or something like that um go on a tour but she joined a cult while she was over there so the story begins with this this woman arriving at an airport uh in, in america and she gets picked up by this guy and she thanks him thank you for meeting me and all that sort of thing and he's very rude with her he's, he's very curt with her he's telling her to hurry up he's leaving her to carry her bags herself and um, when they get into the car he he becomes quite aggressive he's demanding the money in advance she says well i have the money i've got the twenty thousand. we agreed and then he starts to become more aggressive and he says well that's only for today it's twenty thousand per day it's not that's not the fee that's per day and she's getting a bit upset she's getting a bit concerned she's worried you know why I, I that's all i have that's all our savings he's telling her i don't care sell your houses we have to cash in your pensions and she's getting very upset and as she starts to become upset he becomes very rude he's shouting at her screaming at her to shut up and he's blaming her you know uh what kind of parents are you your daughter goes and joins the first gang of lunatics that that she meets and she again she's getting very very upset the more upset she's getting the more he's shouting at her the more he's shouting at her the more she's apologizing for being upset which is a crazy situation if you think about it you know apologizing for being upset for someone treating you very badly but this goes on for about five maybe ten minutes and then he pulls the car over to the side of the road and he just asks her he says i've known you for about five minutes five minutes you've allowed me to abuse you be rude to insult you i have treated you with contempt why would you do that now she's naturally very confused she doesn't know what's just happened and she's you know what's going on and then he makes the point to her you think i have something you need you think i can do something for you that maybe no one else can do and because of that you're prepared to allow me to treat you disgracefully now it's a very graphic scene but he was making a really good point now albeit that was about a cult um the number of times very abusive people they lead others to believe they have something they need they only they can provide the physio physiological needs only they can provide safety only they can give them the love the belonging the validation and so on and this if you will this is the key to how so many people coerce and manipulate others by manipulating that sense of needs so how they do it would be first of all by exploiting um somebody's um by exploiting their victims in the sense that they maybe they control the resources again go back to the physio physiological needs they control the resources they might control the money they um there might even be threats of physical violence just to assert some kind of dominance ensures ensure dependency on the person by controlling the money by controlling the resources by um only allowing them out certain times they have to check up on them and so on 
even the food, even even the roof above their head, there could be threats. You know, you do what you're told or you're out. You know, somebody might be saying, but hold on, it's my house as well. Well, in that moment, it's theirs. It's like they have control. So there's the exploiting of the physio physiological needs. I'm nearly speaking tonight. These words will come out. Don't worry. They might not come out in the right order, but they will come out. So they create that dependency, okay, as I say, on the safety. When it comes to the security, that's the same. Um, they create this sense of uncertainty. So the person is never quite sure if they're fully safe. You know, um, are they going to get this? Are they going to be allowed that? Um, there's a, there's a, a state, constant state of flux. There's a lot of conditions. Sometimes those conditions can be very unreasonable. They're ever shifting. But the person keeps trying to meet those conditions. And the controlling narcissistic person, they're using this um, to control their victim, to maintain that power dynamic. Again, you are dependent on me. Um, I'm the one earning the money. I'm the one paying the bills. I'm the one doing this. Or I need to be able to control your money because you can't handle it properly. I know much more about whatever. <coughs> Pardon me. They can create a sense of guilt uh, or a feeling of guilt. They can create a sense of obligation in their victims as well because they do it's it's not that coercive people are always always really cruel and cold sometimes they do do things sometimes they do give things again they may be conditional but they do do it and they remind the person that they did it now even though the person maybe had to you know crawl through fire or something in order to get it um they remind them that they do it so uh, again they're they're keeping that control dynamic going on they guilt the person um you know, if they say no, they're withholding. So all of a sudden, their needs aren't being met. There's also the gaslighting. Um, and that's manipulating people. That's rewriting their sense of reality. Um, so the person sometimes, after a long period of time, might not recognize what's safe and what is dangerous anymore. They're always trying to navigate, mitigate the bad stuff in order to try and get the good. So they, they manipulate their sense of reality, um, their memories, they, they doubt their own feelings, their own sanity sometimes. While this is going on, they are still becoming more dependent on that abusive person. Because by now it's almost like they have, they're holding all the cards, if you will, they're calling all the shots. And the person needs that, believes they need that person in order to meet those things. When it comes to the relationship needs, and I think this is common, this is a common reason why, among other things, and it might be an unconscious thing, I think this is why a lot of narcissistic people in particular isolate their victims. They don't like their friends. They don't like their family. Um, they might feel uncomfortable with them working somewhere, um, whatever it is. What they're doing is they're making that person dependent on them for company, dependent on them for connection, dependent on them for validation, for love, and so on. It also makes it easier for them to manipulate and to control um, once they have a, if you will, they have a grip on that person's emotional needs. Because that need to be connected is such a powerful force. Now, I've talked about trauma bonding in, in some of my videos, and this is one of the ways in which they trauma bond the person becomes dependent on them even after the relationship the person believes still that person has something they need they need that they need that that abusive person to maybe apologize to acknowledge what they did they need that person to you know repent somehow or whatever to at least acknowledge the pain they did or the pain they caused which ain't going to happen some cases it does. There are always exceptions. But more often than not, when we're talking about the malignant types, no, that ain't going to happen. If you think of how that happens in the first place, at the beginning of a relationship, they can be very kind. They can be uh, very courteous. They can be very attentive. They can be very compassionate. They can be very generous. And they're creating the environment which someone uh, does feel safe. Um, they, they create that environment where someone does feel a sense of security and they do feel a sense of belonging. It's a little piece at a time. 
the things start to become conditional. The things start to be withdrawn. Uh, it could be, you know, a bad mood. It could be silence treatment. It could be huffing. Sometimes it could be an argument over nothing. But more often than not, it's just a little piece at a time. The person becomes more dependent on their needs. And I keep saying needs, not their wants, their desires, their needs. This person is the only person who can meet those needs. Another thing they do to keep the person in a state of flux, in a state of uncertainty in the relationship part, it's a thing known as triangulation. Now, this is when sometimes a third person or more than that, you know, a couple of people, they get brought into the relationship as well. Um, so their partner, their victim, whatever um, the, the, the role is, whatever the, the relationship is, um, they start to feel a sense of competition and this increases their insecurity. They're friendlier with that person than they are with me or they're, they're flirting with that person and they're ignoring me. Um, so what normally happens again in a long-term situation is the person, they're, they're not happy with it, they're not comfortable with it. If they bring it up, it's gonna cause a fight. They may be punished even further. Um, they may be told that they're being controlling. They're the jealous type, they're being crazy, whatever. What also, what also can happen is they try even harder to meet that person's standards. Again, you're giving attention to these people, but I'm the one that's here. I'm the one who needs it. So again, it's that dependency on the narcissistic person. Moving on to the next stage, the esteem, the feeling good about ourselves. Now, this is the thing about narcissistic people. Again, it depends on where they are on that spectrum. But with narcissistic people, they tend to only, they feel good about themselves when they feel better than others. There is something about narcissism which is very competitive. Um, they like to be the alpha. They like to be in control. They, they like to own. They like to, if you will, they like to be the most attractive person, the funniest person, the most intelligent person. There is something very competitive about them. They only, you know, someone else feeling good or looking good or doing well can be a threat to them. So they only, a lot of times they only feel good about themselves if they're feeling better than other people. So what they tend to do is they they prey on and they exploit things like the other person's self-esteem. Remember, self-esteem is not just what I think about me. It's what I think others think about me. So they prey on that self-esteem. They might show displeasure they might be uh, critical, they might be little ideas, um, achievements, things like that. Sometimes they might even ignore them. doesn't matter what the person does. You know, they could be the first person on Mars. They're more interested in, in what's on Twitter at the moment. You know, wh whatever it is, it's not that big a deal to them. There's a lot of undermining. There's ignoring achievements or there's belittling them. Even skills, even ideas. Someone has an aspiration. I would like to learn how to do whatever. I might roll in the course. That might be a threat to them. They will try and talk them out of it, maybe. Um, that's not for you. I know someone who did that. You know, you're not that sort of person, whatever it is. So there's a lot of undermining. While they're doing that as well, what the person's doing in order to please them, again, is never enough. So their, their need for connection isn't really there, but the hope or the promise of connection is still there. You know, when you've reached this level, when you've done that, when you're able to do whatever, then. But the person is, as I say, kept in a constant state of flux. Lastly, when it comes to the self-actualization, again, remember the competitiveness, but there is also envy. Now, envy is in the DSM, uh, part of narcissism, believing, believing others are envious of them. You know, I tend to add to that. They believe others should be envious of them. If they're not envious of them, there's something wrong with them. There's something bad about them. So what they do, when that person is maybe trying to do something, they may sabotage it. They may rubbish it. Again, they might uh, do any number of things. For example, they they may use that person's resources so that they can't go and do whatever it is they want to do. They may leave them with responsibilities while they go off and do whatever so they can't do whatever they want. 
Um, they may do things to make them late so that they can't get to the interview or they can't get to the class or whatever. They might come up with, um, I don't know, whatever it is, the, you know, whatever the person's arranged, they've suddenly arranged something which is much more important. Either that or they have some incredible illness or whatever. Um, the one that always makes me laugh is, and it was a joke, but um, the time their skull fell out, you know, there'll be something like that anyway. But there is a lot of sabotaging behavior. It's to keep the person away or keep the person from actualizing, from achieving things. As I say, if they do achieve them, it's kind of diminished, it's, it's rubbished, it's criticized or whatever. But they do these things to make sure, that, again, that person does not feel fulfilled. They feel better. They feel good about themselves when they feel better than others. They're not really going to feel good about themselves if someone else is feeling quite fulfilled. If someone is aware of their skills, their talents, if other people are telling them, good job, well done, we appreciate that. Now, this is the thing about the actualizing. I said this is whenever people are aware of their skills, their talents, they achieve something, they put a lot of work into something and they get there. You know, maybe they have to overcome a lot of things, a lot of things. With narcissistic people, what we often see is they want the actualization. They don't necessarily want the effort that goes into it. They don't really want the sacrifice. It's like they want to be the CEO of the organization, but they want it without having to do any training. They want it without having to work their way up through the ranks. Even when they get there, they want it, but without the responsibility. So it's like they want the status that comes from it. But they don't necessarily want the the, the other stuff that comes, the responsibility, the hard work, you know, the buck stops with you kind of thing. They don't necessarily want that. And that's where we see, again, the sense of entitlement. They believe they should be the best. They deserve the best. They should be at the top of the tree. They just don't want the other stuff that comes with it. So, looked at the basic concept of the hierarchy of needs and how those needs can be exploited, making someone dependent that only they can meet those needs, that they're the only person they can go to. But looking at the needs in another way, because you know, people have been in difficult situations, it could have been a workplace, could have been a family, could have been a romantic relationship, where someone has maybe exploited those needs, maybe led them to believe they are dependent on that person. But being aware of those needs can help coming out of that. Um, you know, I always say awareness is a very powerful thing, it will always give you a choice. Um, even like the old saying, knowledge is power. There is something in that. When you recognize the needs, when you recognize where you want to get the needs, maybe where they're not being met, where they're being withheld, where they're being conditional, things like that. The conditions are never met. You know, uh, those needs might be conditional, but if you put your own conditions, well, you're the one that's being selfish. But applying them to the, the recovery process, if you will, you look at the physio physiological needs. First of all, recognize a lot of people have come out of uh, difficult situations, difficult relationships. And this is a concept I often uh, use. It's it's a very CBT based thing. And it's just called updating your memory. Because um, a lot of times we still feel we're stuck. And we still believe that person's the only person that can fix this. The other person's the only person that can do this. When we look at our physiological needs, we may be in a different environment. Um, we may be, we are safe, we can sleep, we have a roof over our head. It might not be the roof we want, it might not be the one we would prefer, It might. we may have had to leave the family home or whatever it was, some people have had to flee in the middle of the night. Um, it's a lot of different things go on. But when we recognize where we are, we have food, we have shelter, okay, we're updating our memory. So there's the first thing, we are no longer dependent on that person if indeed we ever were, but we are no longer dependent on that person because we're doing it ourselves. It may be a struggle financially. It may be a struggle for a lot of different reasons, but we're still doing it. We have our basic necessities. Um, again, food, shelter, water, all that sort of thing. When we look at the safety needs, we may be in a safer environment. Now, 
some people have been in relationships and situations that were physically abusive, um, phys physically violent. Being out of that situation, there is still, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of stuff comes up. But you may be in a, an environment which is safe. Now, you may be in your own place. You may be staying with family. You may be staying with friends. Some people go to shelters, things like that. But one way or another, the environment is quite safe, even if it's just a temporary one, because we may be moving on to somewhere else. It's a it's a, a safe space, a secure space. Um, we can feel protected enough. Again, updating our memory to begin healing. We may even feel safe enough to reach out to others, um, to ask for help, to ask for support, to join groups, um, support groups, speak to therapists, things like that. When we do that, and again, uh, it's not just about feeling safe, it's feeling emotionally safe as well. Recognizing when we update our memories, um, if we do or say something, someone's not necessarily going to criticize us. And if they do, there may be a genuine reason for it. They're not being vitriolic. They're not being horrible. Um, it could just be they just disagree. Um, or they're asking you to think about something you haven't considered. Then after that, we move on to, again, um, our belonging, our sense of connection. Now, this is the thing about being um, narcissistically abused and, and more and more people talking about this subject seem to be agreeing. One of the ways to help is actually connecting with other people. It's, um, you know, getting involved in groups, as I say, uh, friendships, reconnecting. If you have to reconnect with the people you may have been isolated from um, or if not making new connections. Because if you will, one of the things that can help us move forward is being in the company of people that bring out the best in you. People that can laugh with you, not necessarily at you. Um, people who can be constructively critical, but not judgmental. People that can offer ideas. People who are going to listen to your ideas because sometimes you might have a, a, an idea. You might have something you find helpful and you share it with other people. It's one of the things I say sometimes in, in, in the videos I put out. If you find anything helpful, if you feel comfortable enough, share it because someone reading it might benefit from it. Something they hadn't considered. There is something in that when we feel connected. Now, even if it's just online and just a comment like that. There can be something in that that can bring out something in us. We do feel a sense of connection. So we connect or we reconnect with people, um, supportive people, friends, family, whoever it is, people who understand, people who are prepared to listen. They might not necessarily understand, but they're prepared to listen. It was Carl Rogers, um, guy that I would follow, um, a psychologist, the whole person-centered approach to things. He believed that people begin to heal whenever they're heard, whenever they're listened to. Okay, addressing feelings of the isolation as well. If you're out there, if you're on your own, you know, addressing those feelings of isolation, because a lot of the times you're actually, you're not alone. A lot of people who have been in um, very uh, abusive sort of relationships can feel very isolated. They feel as if they're the only person who's ever went through this. And it is so amazingly common the number of people who have experienced the same thing in different degrees and in different situations. Sometimes it's in a workplace. Sometimes it might be with a partner, a husband, wife, whatever. Um, sometimes it, it, it might be in a workplace. It, it might be in a group that we belong to, a, a circle of friends. But it's not unique. We, we, we experience it differently, different situations. But the number of people who go through the same thing, and there is something very powerful about being able to connect with others, share stories, um, share ideas, share, you know, show a little bit of empathy to each other, a bit of compassion to each other, things like that. Even doing the things that, doing the things that maybe you weren't allowed to do, that you were talked out of, things that were disapproved of, and, you know, I, I've mentioned it many times when I, I do these live streams, but Jay Reed, I think he puts it absolutely brilliantly, living in defiance. You live in defiance to the person that held you back. You go and you do the things that they didn't approve of within reason, of course. Um, you listen to the music they didn't like. You go and enroll on that course that they thought was a bad idea. You watch the movies that they thought were rubbish. You live in defiance. You start to do things differently. You do things for yourself. 
When we start to do that, again, you think of our esteem. Because the people we've connected with could well be bringing out the best in you, as I say. They're listening to you. They're validating you. When you're doing the things for yourself, when you're learning those new skills, when you're engaging with people, when you are, as you say, living in defiance, you notice the difference when you start to feel good. Sometimes that gives us an energy. An energy, it's a different kind of energy. The energy that we would have felt in that situation, a lot of the energy, every bit of energy we had, we put in just to get through the day, just to manage the day. This is a different kind of energy. This is it's, it's like a power. It's like an energy. It gives us that ability to drive forward. Celebrating our progress is a good thing as well. Looking at the hierarchy of needs, go back. I, I now have a place. I now have a roof over my head. I have a different job. Um, I have friends. I have people who, who care about me, people who listen to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm no longer ruminating, maybe not as much. I'm thinking about things differently. Celebrate. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Every little step, you celebrate the progress. You mark it. If you journal, make a note of it um, because it's always there for you. Go back and read it. Maybe you can start doing things, listening to things that for a long time you didn't think you were allowed to. Even small steps take you towards uh, or, or have you on that path to recovery. Remembering as well, again, when it comes to our esteem, sometimes we are going to have a setback. Sometimes we're going to be in a situation, we're going to meet someone who reminds us of, they're going to behave in a certain way, or sometimes we might see that person, we might have to have some kind of contact. One way or another, something can happen, and it can set us back. It's important to remember that recovery is not a linear path. It's not a straight line. And I can't emphasize this enough either. It's not a mad race. It's not a mad dash to a finish line. It's a journey. It's a step at a time. And sometimes we have to take a step backwards in order to be able to move forward. Sometimes we have to take a step to the side. Sometimes we have to change direction. And that's perfectly okay. That's normal. But recognizing it's it's not this it's not this push button thing, it's not this um, it's not this as I say a mad race. It's a journey. It's a little step at a time. We learn new things as we go. The last thing is when it comes to the self actualization. Now this doesn't have to be anything massive. Um, you don't have to decide you're going to be the first person on Mars or whatever. It could be a small thing. It could be maybe trying to get an extra shift in work. It could be trying to get a promotion in work. It could be um, looking, uh, going online, looking at different things that interest you. Are there any groups that teach that? Are there any groups that maybe talk about that? Um, it be, could be going out into your community. It could be, you know, arranging to meet someone for a coffee. They do not have to be big things. They are small little steps. Remember, when it comes to the self-actualization, it doesn't matter how far we get anyway. Even if we do reach that pinnacle, it's not long before we have a new challenge and we will want to aspire to do something else. We'll get the job we want, but it's not long before maybe we either want a better job or maybe we want a promotion. So it's okay to recognize that when it comes to that, the, the set and the goals, they only have to be small ones. They don't have to be mass massive ones. Focusing as well on your personal growth the things that we learn from. Engage in activities that can contribute to, you know, your emotional well-being, your intellectual well-being, even if you will, your spiritual development. You as a person, um, recognizing that as you're living in defiance, maybe as you're doing those things that maybe you were talked out of, there aren't necessarily negative consequences. The world does not come crashing down. You still have your esteem being met. You still have your sense of belonging, you still have your safety needs, you still have your physiological needs. Nothing is being withheld from you. You're meeting your own needs. Now, sometimes, yes, other people can help us meet them as well, but they're not necessarily being withheld. Okay. That's a kind of a whirlwind um, sort of outline of the hierarchy of needs, the concept of it, how it can be exploited, but also how we can use it in our recovery. 
even ticking off each level. And sometimes as we tick off each level, there are other things can be added, some things can be taken away, but one way or another, we're still making some kind of progress. I said at the beginning, there's a difference between our needs and our wants. Sometimes we believe we need that other person to, again, acknowledge, to apologize, to, to feel some sense of justice or whatever. If we can get that so much, the better. Absolutely. I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. If we can get that so much, the better. But if we believe we can't move forward until we get that, a lot of times we may be holding ourselves back. It may make our recovery longer. Sometimes it might make it more difficult. Sometimes we might need different areas of support. But it doesn't necessarily have to keep us stuck. Okay, now, some things that might help with your recovery. Again, if you think in terms of, of the, the hierarchy of needs. First of all, seeking help. Professional help, therapist, whoever, um, you know, an organization, whatever. Um, it can be helpful in working through some of the things um, that we experience to make sense of them, um, to learn to manage things like our, our triggers, to be able to plan uh, a way forward or a way through something. Practicing self-care as well. A lot of the times people in, in very controlling abusive relationships, they neglect their self-care because again, they're thinking the other person can do something for them, can give them something. So they neglect their own self-care, their own needs in order to pander to someone else's demands. So take care of your own sense of well-being. Practice self-care, whatever that happens to be. Engage in, in things, in activities that promote things like relaxation, fun, laughing, things that reduce stress, help you to connect with other people. Engage in a little bit of self-compassion as well. The way I look at self-compassion is sometimes it's not an easy thing to do because sometimes we do hold ourselves to very um, uh, rigid kind of stance. We blame ourselves uh, for a lot of different things. If you think of self-compassion this way, you imagine you are someone that you really care about. You're your best friend or whoever it is, someone you love to bet, someone you don't want to see anything bad happen to. Just talk to yourself the way you would talk to them. Treat yourself the way you would treat them. You imagine someone comes to you with a problem, a difficulty. They're telling you everything that pretty much you've been through. You think about what kind of advice you would give them, what sort of things you might do to be able to help them, what things you might suggest. Self-compassion is really just talking to yourself as if you're someone that you really care about. Okay. You understand, again, things like the, the, the little bit of education, understanding the, the dynamics of, of abusive people, how they go about it, um, the different kind of behaviors, the mindsets. The knowledge can be quite empowering, but there is a danger sometimes we go down a rabbit hole because we want to know more and more and more. So as much as that is important, it is important to learn about yourself as well. How we react to things, the way we behave, uh, the way we behave around things, some of our own belief systems. Um, if you can get therapy, brilliant. Some people find coaching helpful. It's a, it's a different approach. It's a different thing. But some people prefer uh, life coaching. Um, things like these live streams. I've done loads of live streams looking at the different concepts of you know reframing thinking, solution finding stuff. Not just mine, there's a lot of people out there who do uh, a lot of really good stuff, podcasts and so on. Um, there's stuff online, there's books. I'm a big, uh, big believer in self-help books. Nothing wrong with a self-help book. Sometimes you can read a whole book and you just get one thing out of it. See that one thing? That might be the thing that makes a difference. So educating yourself, not just on the behavior of other people and why they behave, but sometimes on ourselves as well. Because when we get that sense of understanding, that can help us move forward. So I put it this way. Coping strategies are good. God knows I use enough myself. Coping strategies are good. But sometimes if you start ruling out the things that don't work, the things that don't help you, sometimes the things that hold you back, sometimes you don't need a coping strategy. You just stop doing the things that hold you back. Another idea is to create boundaries. Now, we can have boundaries 
they can be healthy boundaries they don't have to be too rigid our boundaries can be flexible in the sense that they can change in different relationships with different people and sometimes those boundaries they may be a red line that's okay they they have to be rigid but other other times no we can be flexible with them we can change our mind and when you think of your boundaries you think of your values, you think of your limits, you think of your integrity, you think of your self-respect. You can think of other people's boundaries as well, and you can respect those boundaries, but not necessarily at the cost to your own. You can have the boundaries. Um, the boundaries can help you have healthier relationships. People know what's expected. People know what's acceptable and what isn't. And, you know, the sign of a good relationship, I think, is when people, um, first of all, their boundaries can maybe be flexible from time to time, but they respect each other's boundaries. They don't make too many demands on each other, too, on, too many unreasonable demands, certainly not without reciprocating. And as I said about the patience and the self-compassion, give yourself a bit of time. Um, remember, it is a process. It's not a mad race. It's a journey. It's a process. So I said earlier on about marking down those little goals, those little things you've achieved, those little things you've accomplished, and it doesn't matter what it is. No one has the right to tell you whether or not it's relevant or not. Only you can discern that. To someone else, it might seem like nothing, but to you, it could be a very important thing. Other people might think it was absolutely amazing what you did. It was absolutely astounding what you've done. To you, it might not be that big a deal. But one way or another, you mark down everything. You make a note of every little goal that you accomplish show yourself a bit of kindness as well because we're not always going to get it right i think sometimes sometimes we can't actually learn unless we get it wrong sometimes we have to fail before we we get it right so you give yourself permission you're trying to set a boundary you might make a mistake whenever you're trying to be assertive you might come across as aggressive more so than you wanted to learn from it or you may be trying to be a bit more assertive and the other person talks you down. You know, uh, they raise their voice or they fold their arms, stick their lip out, whatever, and you back down. You still have to learn from that in order to be able to move forward. Otherwise, we keep doing the same thing again. And lastly, again, if you will, the antidote um, or one of the things that can help are other people avoid isolation it doesn't necessarily mean we have to tell everybody everything we don't have to walk around with our heart on our sleeve we don't have to divulge every bit of information we have but reaching out to others again going for a coffee taking part in groups learning new skills in a class whatever it happens to be avoiding the isolation meeting people who are decent meeting people who can sometimes be stern but they're fair meeting people who are incredibly funny but there's no malice in their humor meeting different kinds of people you avoid isolation if you can maybe try to reconnect with as i say the people in your past the people you might have lost contact with because they were maybe friends for a reason you were maybe close to them for a reason try to find a way to reconnect with them if you can and i'm going to leave you with a thought I think we're only ever as needy as our needs that aren't being met. That's why I say it's different from our wants, our demands, our lusts, our preferences. We're only as needy as our needs that aren't being met. So that's pretty much the end of this. I'm going to have a look at some of the questions. I'm going to see if there anything I can answer. Uh, hello, Denise. Hello, basketball fan. Uh, hello, is it Ivy? This is the thing about very vocals. You have to look all over the place to be able to see properly. Um, okay, so nothing wrong with having needs. Susan, you're absolutely right. Everybody has needs. People who tell you they don't have needs. Um, I'd be very curious. Uh, what exactly is it you think you don't need? We all need somewhere to sleep. We all need food. We can't function. We can't live without it. We need water. Of course, we all have needs. Okay. I'm tolerant, I'm happy, I was treated like that. Treated like a problem, a terrible problem as a child, severe health issues. Um, we all have different kinds of needs. They're the basic needs. Um, those needs may differ. Sometimes we do have needs because of health conditions. 
Um, sometimes we have needs for uh, emotional, um, maybe mental health things going on. We all have different kinds of needs. Think about what I'm saying. We're only as needy as our needs that aren't being met. We're, if I put it to you this way, someone were to say to you, every time I walk into the room, I need you to show me how special I am. I need that validation. I, I need that reassurance because you see me, I've got terrible anxiety and all the rest of it. So you see, every time I walk into the room, I need you to stop what you're doing. I need you to give me a hug. I need you to tell me that you love me. That's not a need. Okay, that's not a need. That's a demand. Because not everybody is, is going to want that. That is going to need that. You might have a hard day at work. The last thing you want to do is to give someone a hug and tell them how much you love them. You just want to take your shoes off, put your head in your hands, catch your breath for 10 minutes, whatever it is. We can't always do things like that. So that wouldn't be a need. Um, people might need support, physical support. People might need um medication they might need um to avoid certain foods in their diet um or they might need certain foods in it we all have different kinds of needs the very basic needs uh the ones that keep us alive the ones that we can't function without okay uh, what are we going to Yeah, um, using mind games, words affect your heart. And we take the blame and get sick. Yeah, um, we do that. I think whenever we hear something often enough, even if we don't believe it, I think there's something maybe unconscious going on. We, we maybe really don't believe it, but we hear it so much. It, it almost becomes, um, it just becomes ingrained. Now, if we were to believe it, you know, we probably wouldn't struggle and we wouldn't be talking about it afterwards i think we know in our heart of hearts we are not bad people we are not abusive we 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 are not being unkind for having needs we're not being selfish because we need to be heard we need to be listened to the people that tell us things like that do you ever notice the people that tell us things like that are the same people that would tell you you're you're not meeting their needs because you don't give them a hug and a kiss and tell them how wonderful they are every time you see them. They're very rarely are they reciprocated. Okay. What else are we? I was told I went to clown college. I was told that too, funny enough. said I never used my art degree. Well, that's an example of the self-actualization. Um, you achieve something, you, you get a degree in art and it becomes undermined. Now, people might not necessarily understand your degree. They might not even approve of it. They might have preferred you to go into, um, oh God, my mind's one black. Might, might have wanted you to go into um, banking or something like that, be an accountant or whatever. So they don't, necessarily understand your passion for art so whenever you do achieve something they don't necessarily get it it's not that big a deal to them they don't they don't fully get it they don't celebrate it as much and again when you think of your own self-esteem you know what we think others think of us that can affect our confidence that can affect our esteem it even affects our choices we start to question ourselves was i right to do this in the first place well, the only person that can discern that is you. Whether or not you ever use that degree is entirely up to you. The fact is, this is the thing about education and, and training and experience and things like that. I don't think we ever lose it. It's it's always there if you want to draw on it. Uh, let me see. It's a bit it's the bit I always mutter. Sometimes if I hear we play back of this, I just hear myself muttering when I'm doing this bit. <laughs> yeah, the, you're right. The future hasn't been written. Um, I think the most we'll ever do is influence the future. We can aim for it. We don't know what's coming next. There are um, always unforeseen factors. Things can change. We can even change our mind. Um, I think you've every right to change your mind because if we didn't change our mind, let me put it this way. If we didn't change our mind at the age of six, I told my mom I wanted to be an astronaut. You know, if, if I'd have stuck to that, 
I'm a field astronaut, you know. Um, no, you can change your mind. It doesn't have to be written in stone. There are other things come up. Sometimes we get new information. This is the thing about critical thinking. Critical thinking is not just having an idea and thinking, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to go and do that. Critical thinking is when you have that idea, you have that desire, whatever it is, and you think about it, but you think about it as, as different potentials. What could go right? What could go wrong? What's it going to cost me? Is it going to be worth it in the long run? It might feel good in the moment. In the long term, it could really do me damage. Also, if you make that decision and you're going ahead and you're doing it, critical thinking allows you to recognize there's this is there's more going on here than I thought. This is going to take longer or, do you know what? I've changed my mind. This is not what I want. This is not what I thought it was. So I'm going to change direction. That's all critical thinking is. You're right. The future isn't set in stone because we can change our mind. Other things come up. Um, the most we'll ever do is influence it. Sometimes that kind of makes it exciting. I didn't set out to be a counselor. Uh, Yeah. A graft in a fruit tree. Branches may be broken and cut, other branches may be added, removed. As long as the roots in the trunk and the tree are there, it's vital. And so is regrowth. Yeah, absolutely. And the, your analogy of the tree, um, Oceana, is a good one. I look at trees as well when it comes to human beings. As much as we're very similar, as much as we all have commonalities, we're all different. If you think of a tree, you see the tree there, but what you don't see are the roots that lead up to it. So we never really know how or why someone gets to be where they are, how they are. It doesn't matter where they are in life because there's many different roots lead up to it. But even once you get to the tree, there are so many different branches and they go in so many different directions. So it's never really a one size fits all. And um, it's there's something of a mystery about it. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And you're right, some of those branches Maybe they're dead. Maybe there's something you know bad about them. Whatever it is, yeah, we cut them off. Other ones get grafted on. The tree itself is still alive, and it can still grow. It can still thrive. Very sad about Sinead O'Connor. Yeah, I heard that earlier, just about five minutes before I came on here. Um, and I'm going to be honest. As soon as I finish this, I'm going to find out more. Um, she's very much of my generation and she's also from my part of the world so by default that kind of makes me a bit of a fan if you know what I mean um can't really give more info on that because I really don't know what happened but I do intend to find out as, as, as soon as we're finished here um Perhaps where hierarchy of needs links directly to your concept of echoism. Um, it's not my concept of echoism. Um, it, it's uh, it's another guy, uh, Craig Malkin. Uh, Malkin. He he's a doctor. It's he's been doing a lot of work on it. Um, where the hierarchy of needs would fit in with that, I think, would be again believing that the needs can only be met by other people. Either that or other people's needs are much more important. Um, having needs of your own can fit. Again, there's a lot of crossovers with highly sensitive people, highly empathic people. Um, believing that having needs of your own is selfish. Um, other people are much more important. Um, it can engage in a lot of people pleasing, a lot of self-sacrifice and a lot of uh, self-effacing uh, kind of behaviors. Um, when I was talking about echoism in, in the last video, I put a link to Craig, Craig Malkin has a YouTube channel. Um, he's he's written a book. I've just ordered it, so I'll, I'll let you know what I think um, when I get it. Rethinking Narcissism. Um, but on his channel, he talks a lot about echoism, about the different the, the, the construct of it, the different concepts of it. He can go a lot more in depth than I can. Um, I just read a lot of the stuff or watched one or two of his videos I put some things together and I, I, I gave my idea of it. If you want to learn more about it, he's the person to, to learn it from. Who knows? Maybe I might ask him, does he want to have a chat? We'll do a, a joint thing. Um, but where the hierarchy of needs would fit into that would be, um, as I say, 
putting other people's needs first, either that or believing that your own needs are selfish, unnecessary. Other people are much more important. Uh, topic for future discussion, stressful relationships, situations. Yeah, um, I could do that as a live stream, Marianne. Uh, I do have um, videos out talking about um, the concept of narcissistic abuse syndrome, which are a lot of crossovers um, with things like CPTSD, but that's the name they give it, um, about how and why um, narcissistic people target, if you will, they target to undermine your self-esteem, your self-confidence. Um, there's stuff out there, I, I, I have playlists if you wanna have a look, there's some stuff there, but it is something I'll revisit in a live stream if, if people want me to. Um, this is the most welcoming, safe feeling comment section you've ever seen. Yeah, th this is, what I would say, a lot of people that um, watch, it always blows me away that the, the, um, the amount of compassion, the, the amount of support that people give to each other, even people who disagree with each other. Um, sometimes if you look at the comments in the videos, they're not, well, some people do, and I, if I can, I can get rid of them. I've learned how to do that recently. Um, but more often than not, the people tend to be very respectful. As I said earlier, when I say, you know, if, if anybody has any ideas, you know, or anything you find helpful, the number of people that do share their ideas, and, and sometimes you get the comments after that, it, it, it blows me. I think human beings are amazing. I think human beings are inherently good by nature. I think there's something goes wrong. There's some kind of malfunction when people come become kind of, you know, wicked and bad. Uh, too, too risk of losing our freedom to take care of ourselves. There is something, I, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. Um, when it comes to our needs as well, sometimes we get people, and this would be probably more, mm, what would I say? It's probably be more common with covert narcissism. They have the same needs everybody else does. Just like we all have the same basic needs according according to Maslow. But what they do is they tend to make everyone else responsible for their needs. A lot of the time with covert narcissism, what you see is a sense of helplessness. Um, you see a heightened sensitivity to things like criticism. And criticism doesn't just have to be negative feedback. It can be just something as simple as being told no. Um, so they tend to, if you will, they, they try to make other people responsible for their happiness, for their well-being, for doing things for them. Um, they can't do it because, you know, their their elbows sore or, you know, the time the fish wasn't well or whatever. There, there's always something, and they tend to make other people responsible to meet their needs. If the person isn't able to meet their own needs, um, you know, depending on where they are on that spectrum, that's that's not a problem to them. They don't really care as long as, as theirs are the ones that, that are getting met. So, uh, Pal Heather has a channel. She will help you get resources. Basketball fan, if you would be kind enough to put the link to that channel in maybe the description of this video, because then people could just click, it, click on it and it'll go straight there. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would appreciate it. I'm sure Heather would appreciate it as well. Um, Especially, I mean, I, I when I talk to other people, I don't do a lot of collaborations, but those I do talk with, ideally, I like to talk to people who have resources, things they can offer people, um, whether that's books, whether that's online stuff, people that can offer things that maybe I can't. I'm, I'm restricted to what I can do. I'm very limited, time limited. Um, so I'm, I'm very keen um that people can avail of different kinds of resources so if you would be uh kind enough to do that uh basketball fan that would be really good i'm sure a lot of people would find that helpful but we've pretty much come to the end of this evening um if you want to learn more about maslow's hierarchy of needs there's a lot of information on it online um abraham maslow fascinating man himself um there's a lot of stuff there if you look at 
where you are, even in your own life, sometimes where you're struggling, there might be um, somewhere on that hierarchy, somewhere you don't feel secure, you don't feel connected, you don't feel, whatever it is, you don't feel you're achieving your true potential. There could be something going on there. It's a, it's a good way to be able to measure different things. Um, it's not the answer to everything. We do all have a multitude of different things going on with us, but it's a good basis. When it comes to, uh, as I say, recovery, the recovery journey, it's a useful little thing if you will, um, not so much a, a to-do list, but it's useful in order to be able to update your memory, to be able to see. Um, maybe you now have a new place, you now have a better job, you're now with a better person, you're now, whatever it is, it's it's useful to help you to update your memory, okay? So this is going to be, uh, let me see, this is a Wednesday, so the next one's going to be a Sunday, um, and that'll be in 10 days' time. As always, about a day or two before, I'll put it out that I'm going to be doing a live stream. And again, I will ask for some ideas. I will, of course, maybe suggest something myself. And if people want me to do that, that's what I will. If you are suggesting something, see if I don't do it. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's just some things I need to do a bit more research on than others. So I can't really do it straight away. Um, so until next time, until next time, everybody, thanks for watching and take care.